Good evening. It is always a privilege and an honor to come again for this second watch on this Lord's Day. I was just thinking in the back that Super Bowl Sunday is nothing but a false hype. I don't remember the last nine Super Bowls since I've been here. How quickly after two weeks you forget all about that. What really matters is Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we stand, let me encourage you to please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible translation. If you can please follow your copy of God's Word. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. We'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 6. When you have arrived, please say amen. amen. The Word of God reads as follows. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could not do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. Let us pray. Father, we come tonight. Your word is pure. I pray we can all say with the psalmist of Psalm 119, verse 90. Oh, how I love thy law. That's verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Not just Sunday morning. But Sunday evening on through the week, may your word be our meditation. Guide us, we pray, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to entitle the message tonight simply, More Than a Carpenter. More Than a Carpenter. A tourist one day was eager to see everything in the art gallery. He fled from picture to picture, scarcely noticing what was in the frames. At the end, he said to one of the guards as he left, I didn't see anything very special here. The guard replied, sir, it's not the pictures that are on trial here. It is the visitors. And we come to a section tonight in the Gospel of Mark. Well, really, the response of the people to Jesus is not really a reflection on Jesus, but on the people. Last week, we went through chapter 5 of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we've seen Jesus uh, in chapter 4 steal the storm, and chapter 5 heal a man that was demon-possessed. Chapter 5, verse 21, all the way to verse 43 we see that Jesus is received by the multitudes and there was a man by the name of Jairus who comes and requests for Christ to come and heal his daughter who was on the brink of death. While he goes to Jairus' house, a woman with a hemorrhage for 12 years reaches out to touch the hem of his robe and she was immediately healed from her hemorrhage. The Bible says that when Jesus came to Jairus' house, he just reached out and laid his hand on his daughter. And said, Talitha Kum, little girl, arise. And she got up immediately, began to walk. Now, you can refer to the last section of Mark chapter 5 as the reward of faith. That, that Jesus rewards those who trust in him. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 that without faith, it's impossible to, 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 to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But as we transition in from chapter 5 to chapter 6, there's a different crowd that we see in this section. Uh, this is a crowd that, that 
like that man running through the art gallery, looking at the pictures and said, there's nothing really special here. We see the response of the people that Jesus preaches to in the city of Nazareth. They're like that man, and yet they fail to realize that Jesus is not the one that's on trial. It's the people. Now, you can entitle this section of Mark chapter 5, the Mark chapter 6, the rejection of unbelief. We go from the reward of faith in chapter 5 to the rejection of unbelief in chapter 6. You'll notice in your bulletin tonight we have an outline. This outline reads as follows, two honors, two honors that belong to Jesus that every human being will one day acknowledge. The first honor that belongs to Jesus that one day every human being will acknowledge is Jesus is more than a man. He is God. It says in verse 1 to verse 3. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown and his disciples followed him. He went out from there. He went out from Capernaum. That's where Jesus has been uh, primarily teaching and preaching throughout most of his three-year ministry. Uh, Capernaum was his, his place of operation. Uh, after he is baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, he returns to Nazareth and preaches. They reject him there. Then he goes to Capernaum where, where, where Peter and Andrew and James and John reside, and, and he begins to make his home base there. Capernaum is the place where he calls his first disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. This is the location where he did all of his miracles and his teaching and his preaching. This is the location where Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. This is the location where the lady with the 12-year hemorrhage was healed immediately. And now as we come to the end of chapter 5 and come over to chapter 6, verse 1, the text says he came out from there. Referring to Capernaum, and came of himself into the country of his own or his own home town. Jesus leaves Capernaum, travels 20 miles southwest to Nazareth, literally his father's town. This is where he was raised. Uh, this is why he was referred to as Jesus the Nazarene throughout the gospel records, not the book of Acts. This is where he was from. And he comes back to Nazareth, this small village. Uh, there's this obscure town that's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. A town of about 500 residents. He comes into this place for the last time. This is Jesus' second and final visit to Nazareth. Just to give you a little bit of a background here for context's sake, about 10 months to a year ago, after Jesus received the Holy Spirit in the sense of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he was compelled to go out to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, it says that he was full of the Spirit. And he overcame the temptations of the devil. And then it says in chapter 4 of Luke that he came back to Nazareth in the power of the Spirit. All right. and, and, and when he came back to Nazareth, he came to the synagogue. The text says on the Sabbath, as was his custom. And, and the synagogue official, a man like Jairus, who had control of who were teaching and preach on that day, gave the scroll to Jesus. Jesus opened the scroll up to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2a, and it read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to grant release to the prisoners and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he closed the scroll, sat down and said, This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That means, in other words, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one of the Old Testament that you've been waiting for. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to preach the gospel. What's the gospel? He sent me. And the people looked and they were speaking well of him. And they say, is this not Joseph's son? Luke 4, 22. And then Jesus says, uh, you're going to quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. 
Whatever we heard was done in Capernaum, we want you to do here. And then Jesus says, a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. In other words, since you will not receive me as who I am, the Messiah, I will perform no miracles before you. I'm going to treat you like Elisha and Elijah did in the Old Testament, where there were many widows in the land of Israel during the time of Elijah, but he was sent to only one woman, a widow, in Zarephath, and he blessed her. There were many lepers in Israel during the time of Israel's apostasy from the Lord, but the Lord only sent Elisha to Naaman and healed him, a Gentile, and the folk got upset about that. They, 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 basically, Jesus is saying that I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to heal anybody. I'm not going to bless anybody here because you have not received me as the Messiah. Because I'm your hometown boy, don't mean you can tell me what to do. Uh, wow. They didn't like that. They went from speaking well of Jesus to being full of rage. They removed him out of the synagogue, took him to the, to the, to the edge of a cliff to throw him off. Jesus turned and moved from their midst and went on to Capernaum. That was about a year ago. Now we come to the text this evening. And Jesus returns to Nazareth for one last time. It says, and when he came to his hometown, his disciples also followed him. And this is the reason now for his divine mission back to the town of Nazareth. He's not returning to have any personal, for any personal reasons. He's not trying to catch up with any old high school friends. He's not returning to Nazareth for any family reunions or, or to try to get his family members to understand that he's not losing his mind as they thought he was in Mark chapter 3 verse 21 and 22. He's only here for ministry purposes. A couple of verses later, later in this very chapter, from verse 7 to 13, we see the Lord sending out the apostles, and he's calling them to go out and preach the gospel throughout Galilee. So this section here tonight, church, is really training for the disciples. Uh, this is a, a training that Jesus has taken them on personally for them to understand the type of response they will receive when they preach a Christ-centered message. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In this section, we'll notice how the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who hear it. In other words, church, it's not a person's religious devotion that gives evidence of where they stand spiritually. It's how they respond to Jesus. When the Sabbath came, verse 2, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is his wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hand. He comes back to Nazareth. On a Sabbath, as was his custom, church, that means Jesus was made sure he was always in worship every week. And, and by the providence of God, he was granted by the synagogue official an opportunity to preach the word on that day after being rejected by that same congregation a year ago. The first point the disciples are to understand is that if the Lord has called you into the ministry, he will provide an opportunity to, for you to preach his word. All right. All right. And you shouldn't be concerned about what people think, but only to preach and proclaim his truth. This was a, an act of divine grace. Jesus returns to the place where he was rejected by his own people, and God gives him another opportunity. To receive salvation. Right. Jesus did not allow his heart to be closed. Towards those who rejected him. As he's preaching. As, as he's breaking forth the word of God. The text says that many listeners were astonished. Mm -hmm. They were literally blown away. 
They were mesmerized by Jesus. And they began to ask the question, where did this man get these things? And where's the wisdom given to him and, 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 and such miracles as performed by his hand? What source did this one get these things? They know that Jesus was not uh, raised as a rabbi. He was a carpenter. He didn't go to the seminaries down in the south in Jerusalem. He, he didn't go to the schools with the Pharisees. That, that He wasn't trained in that way. He was just an ordinary man growing up among them for 20 years, that those hidden years of Jesus' life prior to his ministry at the age of 30. And they want to know what, what's the source of these things, the insight that he has into the Scripture, the wisdom to articulate the Scripture and apply it, the power to perform miracles. And yet, ironically, he had already told them over a year ago, he's the Messiah, but they refused to believe that. They were actually listening to God preach his own word in human flesh. Where's his wisdom? Where'd it come from? And such miracles as these performed by his hand. These miraculous powers are issuing forth from his hand. They refused, church, to receive him as the Messiah. In their minds, Jesus was no different than them possibly even less than them. Notice what they say in verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, son of Mary, brother of James and Hoses and, and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. That They began to scale back and give what they thought were legitimate reasons to discount his messiahship in light of the full revelation of his wisdom, knowledge, and power. They said, is this the carpenter? And in fact, literally, is this one the carpenter? It's, it's, it's not, is Jesus the carpenter, but is this one? A sense of disdain. It's a derogatory address. This is a condescending notion that they give towards Christ. It's almost like, He's a nobody. To say this one, is, he's a nobody. Now we know that the residents of Nazareth had the reputation outside of their town of being nobodies. We know in the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 45 and 46, Philip came to Nathaniel and said, We have found the one, Jesus of Nazareth, who Moses talked about. And Nathaniel says, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, outside of this village, everybody looked down on Nazareth. It would be, to, to technically speaking, in the ancient world, Nazareth would be considered a ghetto. Nothing good comes out, they think, a ghetto. And yet it's interesting. Everybody outside of Nazareth looked down on the folk in Nazareth. You would think the folk in Nazareth would not, would not look down on each other. They would treat these, each other a different way, but they treated Jesus as if he was a nobody. He's a carpenter. <laughs> the word carpenter, tecton, is where we really get the word in our English, technician. It, it, it refers to someone who's a skilled workman, a craftsman, a, a builder, someone who takes materials like wood and stone and, and, and makes great things. And, and In fact, the historical background in Jesus' early Childhood, there was a, a place about, about three miles from the village of Nazareth called Sepphorius. And Sepphorius was a Roman uh, location and it had been destroyed by the Romans. And it's believed uh, by some historians that Jesus and Joseph went there and helped build up that place. Uh, Justin Martyr, uh, who came after John the Apostle died, made a statement that Jesus was one who had made plows and, and yokes. There's another person who in John uh, Oswald Sanders' book, The Incomparable Christ, stated that there was one in a, there was only one shop in Nazareth where benches were made to stand on four legs and doors to pin and shut properly and no second rate work ever left his bench. Referring to Jesus. 
That means any work that Jesus did as a carpenter was good. Why? Because he was more than a carpenter. Isn't it fitting, isn't it interesting that the earthly trade that Jesus Christ would have would be one who made things with his hands. Because the one that made things with his human hands had already made things by his divine hand in the Bible. It says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 3, all things came into being by him and apart from him nothing came into being. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Amen. To the point that when David looks at creation, in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, he, he says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, it didn't take you much, the moon and the stars thou hast ordained, what is man that you would take thought of him? That when you look at creation, you see the handiwork of Jesus. It says in Isaiah 40, verse 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marched off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by measure? He is more than a, car car a carpenter. Amen. He is creator. Right. Isaiah 48, verse 13, Surely thy hand founded the earth, thy right hand spread out the heavens, when I call to them, they stand together. The Lord even had to tell Job, where were you? When I laid the foundation of the earth, tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched out the line on it? And on what was its basis sunk? And who laid its cornerstone? Job 26 verse 7 who stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. And yet this God became a man and was making stuff in a shop. Jesus is a wonderful creator. Even before his incarnation, he was creating and forming. And the things that he made are considered wonderful. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. David says, you form my inward parts. You form my lungs and my heart and my liver and my kidneys and my brain and my cells. You weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. When God made you, when God the Son made you, he said, you're wonderful. Amen. Everything that he makes even in his incarnation, when it comes to redemption, is wonderful. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, for we are his workmanship. We're his masterpiece. That God would take a sin. See, the wonderful thing, as one person said, is not, it's not the beauty of the fact that God can create a universe out of nothing. That's remarkable. What more remarkable than that is that God could take a sinner and fashion that sinner into a saint. That's a miracle. And the Bible says we are his workmanship. Yeah. Where, where is our work? Created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus is still doing some carpentry right now. It says in John chapter 14, verse 2, D and 3, I go prepare a place for you. Right now he's working up in heaven right now in his heavenly Jerusalem. In his father's mansion or many dwelling place, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I'm finished, I'm going to come back and get you and receive you to myself. Jesus is a carpenter, but more than a carpenter. He is God in human flesh. Notice in verse 3, they also responded, is this carpenter not the son of Mary? This is another condescending assessment of our Lord by referring to him as the son of Mary. Uh, Jesus is the legal son of Joseph. Joseph, by the time Jesus begins his public ministry, is probably already dead. Yet it was the custom in Jewish culture to associate the male child with his daddy, not his mama. Thus the child to be associated with his mother would be considered illegitimate. Now it's interesting in Luke chapter 4 verse 22, when Jesus 
preaching at synagogue a year ago in Nazareth, they said, is this not Joseph's son? But now that he won't do what they want him to do, they say he's Mary's son. Isn't that something? As it to insinuate, we don't really know who his daddy is. And this is their miss or this distortion of the virgin conception. It says in John 8, 41, Jesus says to the Jews, you're doing the deeds of your father. They said, we're not born of fornication as to insinuate Jesus was. We have one father, even God. So the statement son of Mary was derogatory in nature. That yet they failed to see that Jesus is the son of Mary in the sense that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. This was the virgin conception. Jesus did not have two human parents, but the Holy Spirit placed the holy seed in Mary's womb. Therefore, he is more than the son of Mary. He is the son of God. And they continue, and his brothers, James and Joses and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? Now, 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 this is a problem verse for Roman Catholics because they hold to the perpetual virginity of Jesus. I'm a Mary, of Mary, professional virginity of Mary. <laughs> that she never had sexual relations with her husband, Joseph. That she remained a virgin throughout all of her life. In fact, to avoid the mentioning of these names here, uh, a man by the name of Jerome concluded, no, th these must be Jesus' cousins. Epiphanitis stated that, no, this must be children from Joseph's previous marriage. Just made that up. But I believe it's clear that Joseph and Mary had children together after the birth of our Lord. That, that Mary would not have been married to Joseph and remained as a virgin all her life. Therefore, based on the listing of these names, Jesus had brothers and sisters. It seems clear that Mary and Joseph had at least six children together. Since so Jesus was the firstborn to Mary, the first child that she had with Joseph is James, who later became the leader of the early church in the book of Acts and wrote the book of James. Yossi's next born. Then you have Judas or Jude, who wrote the epistle of Jude, and Simon. Based on Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we understand that they are in the upper room as it nears the day of Pentecost, that they had believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior after their resurrection. Throughout his earthly ministry, according to John chapter 7, verse 5, they didn't believe on him. But after his resurrection, God saved them. But the point here, in the naming of Jesus' mother and siblings, is to discredit Jesus' claim as the Messiah. Are you with me? Verse 3, and they took offense at him. They stumbled. The Greek, the Greek words where we get our English word, scandal. They were, they, they, they utilized all of these, these, uh, these incomplete facts and, and distorted rumors. And as they put this all together, it caused them to be offended or to stumble at Jesus' claim that he was the Messiah. Am I making sense? Instead of taking what he preached and what he did with the miracles and formulate from there the evidence as to whether he was the Messiah. No, they, they took the fact he was the son of Mary and he got half brothers and sisters and they, they wanted to formulate from there. He's just an ordinary man. They didn't want to look at, the, look at his divinity as demonstrated by his teaching, wisdom, and miraculous powers. They used his human origin to discount his divine nature, and as a result, they were offended that he would even call himself the Messiah. Church, if we're not careful, we can do the same thing too. We can develop an incomplete picture from selected verses of scripture concerning Jesus and to the extreme and say this is who he is to the neglect of everything else that is said about him in his word. There are those who only want the meek and lowly Jesus but are offended by the sovereign and holy Jesus. 
There are those who speak only of the love of Jesus, but never of the wrath of the Lamb. There are those who delight in the grace of Jesus, but despise the judgment of Jesus. In other words, like the people of Nazareth, they want a Jesus who was on their level. Not a Jesus who is infinitely above their level. They want a Jesus they can master. They didn't want a Jesus they can be mastered by. In this lesson, the disciples had to understand that though people might speak well of Jesus, though they might receive his miracles and his healings, they would be unwilling to receive him for who he really is. People love when Jesus blesses them. They don't like it when Jesus commands them. They want a Savior to heal them of their sufferings, not a Lord to rule over them and tell them what to do. But Jesus was not going to allow himself to be redefined by sinners. I, I, I want him as Savior, but not as Lord. He ain't going to allow himself to be redefined by sinners. And the disciples had to learn that the gospel that they preach concerning Christ must be preached without compromise. Am I making sense? It takes us to the second honor that belongs to Jesus that every human being one day will acknowledge. It's given to us in verse 4 to verse 8. Jesus Christ is more than a prophet. He is Lord. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. This was a sort of an axiomatic truth that familiarity breeds contempt. That, that, that Jesus is known as a hometown boy. And, and, and therefore, outside of his own hometown, he received honor. But when he went home, they looked down upon him. This is similar to what we see about Jeremiah. As he's preaching to Israel, his own people, they looked down on him as he preached. Did the same with Isaiah and Ezekiel and all the prophets of old. Notice here that, that Jesus goes from... He goes from the outward circle down to the inward circle. He says, a prophet is without honor except in his hometown, Nazareth. Then he goes a little in, inward, a little bit more, his own relatives, and even his own household. He is without respect. But notice Jesus refers to himself as a prophet. A prophet is someone who's sent by God to speak on behalf of God. But Jesus was not just any prophet. He was the prophet. In fact, it says in Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19, that Moses says there's going to be a, a prophet that will come after me who will speak God's word to you. This is in accordance to what you requested at Mount Horeb, at Mount Sinai. When God speak, spoke forth his Ten Commandments in the voice of thunder, you said, no, 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 we, we don't want God to speak to us anymore. Let Moses speak to us. And, 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 and Moses says, in light of that request, God one day will become a man in the person of Jesus Christ to speak God's word in the voice of a man. That's why, listen, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. In other words, it is grace that when Jesus came, that God did not speak through the voice of Jesus with thunder but with the compassion and the tenderness for the voice of a man. He's more than a prophet. He is God who speaks God's word. He is a prophet. He is the prophet. God in human flesh. And the text says in verse 5, he could do no miracle there except lay his hands on a few people and heal them. He could do no miracle there. Doesn't mean he, he didn't have uh, the ability to do it. It's not, it's not an issue of that he could not perform a miracle. He would not perform a miracle. This has nothing to do with the ability but divine sovereignty. It says in Matthew 13, 58, and because of their unbelief, he did not do many miracles there. See, the purpose of miracles was to help assist faith. It was to help them to understand that, to, to authenticate that the message that he preached concerning himself has to be of God because he's performing these miracles. That's what Nicodemus came to the conclusion. No man can 
perform these miracles unless God is with them. And yet, even though Jesus performed these miracles, and the people of Nazareth heard these about these miracles, they had their mind made up already. They were not going to believe no matter what Jesus did. Therefore, he, he performed no miracle, except he laid his hands on a few people and healed them. Jesus, more than a carpenter, we've seen so far he's creator, he is prophet, he is sovereign, and he's a healer. And he wondered, verse 6, at their unbelief, and he was going around the villages teaching. He wondered, he, he marveled. Now, there's about 30 times this verb is used in the gospel record, being amazed and, and wondering. Yet only three times is this word used in relation to Jesus. Three times, and yet out of three times, it really boils down to two occasions. There's an occasion of a Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8 who had a slave that was paralyzed and sick and in pain. He comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'm asking you to heal my slave, my servant. Jesus said, I'll go with you and heal him. He said, no, no. I'm unworthy for you to come under my house. But I have people under me, and I tell them to do something, they do something. And I'm asking you, just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. And the text said Jesus marveled. He marveled at a Gentile that would demonstrate more faith than the people of Israel. And what we see here in this text, even with the one with the, the, the Roman centurion, is that not everyone who is privileged with certain advantages will make full use of them. Sometimes there are those who are not privileged as others and yet receive more blessings than they do when it comes to God's kingdom. The Roman centurion believed. He didn't have the Old Testament. He wasn't involved. His ancestors were not involved in the miracles of Christ or God over Israel. Rahab believed in Joshua chapter 2. She didn't even see a Red Sea parting. And yet those who saw it still remain unbelieving. And there's a sense, church, like the people of Nazareth, that, 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 that we can be privileged to be in church all our lives. Privileged to be under the sound preaching of the word every week and take it for granted. While those who have never been in such a setting, who God brought out of false teaching, hear the word of God in truth, and you see them up in the first row praising God every Sunday because they realize what they've been bought out of. Y'all not hearing me tonight? We, we can scoff at, 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 at evening service because it's all that you know. Familiarity breeds contempt. And not considered an honor to have the word preached yeah. over and over again for 157 years in this yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. And I say this in honor because I'm privileged to be in a church that loves the truth. People today are still listening to Elder Ward's sermons. Amen. People today are still talking about Pastor Baker and Pastor Johnson. Why? Because they, 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 they appreciate the truth of the word of God. And yet we could be here and just not even trip over no more. You know, Jesus marveled here. Let me give you something about unbelief as I close. Unbelief is the sin of being unwilling to act upon the privilege God has given you of being exposed to the knowledge of himself. Unbelief is like that. Being unwilling to take advantage of the privilege to be exposed to the gospel. These Nazarenes were exposed to the teaching of Jesus, the wisdom of Jesus, and the miracles of Jesus. And Jesus marveled. He wondered at their sin of unbelief for at least three reasons. Here's the first reason why they marveled. This is a Bible-believing confessional community of religious people who know the Old Testament. This is not a secular environment. These are people 
who, who, who believe in the God of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Messiah, and yet when Jesus preached to them, they didn't believe. You would expect people who, who, who believe in the true God to receive the word of God, but they rejected it. And it causes me sometimes to, to marvel at folk who have been in the church, who carry their Bibles, who praise God, who confess Jesus as Lord and yet refuse to, to live by the truth they claim. And I marvel at that. I mean, people who, 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 who are doctrinally sound and yet can be so carnally stubborn. Jesus wondered at that. He's not preaching to some pagans. He's not preaching to some atheists. He's not preaching to some agnostics. He's preaching to people who say, yeah, there is one God. His word is the Old Testament, and we believe in the future Messiah. He marveled at that. Second reason I believe he marveled is that these people were undeniably amazed at his teaching, wisdom, and power. They could not discount his truth that he preached or his miracles they performed. They rejected Jesus in the full light of his revelation of himself. This is what was necessary to attest to him being the Messiah, and they still rejected. Thirdly, their unbelief was based on incomplete facts and false reports of his conception. In other words, they chose to believe in incomplete facts and false rumors than to believe in the evidence that was right in front of their face. They, they, they didn't want to see Jesus for who he was. Unbelief, listen, takes what is clear and makes it complicated. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. All your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's clear, but we complicate it. Wow. I don't know. I don't know. I know what it says, trust in him, not lean, but I, I just don't know. Will he make my path straight? It's clear, but we complicate it. Human depravity is not just a condition. It's a desire. It's a condition he cannot overcome, and it's a desire he doesn't want to overcome. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Does not subject itself to the law of God, not even able to do so. Yet Jesus, for the last time, and as a lesson to his disciples, he comes to Nazareth. And he preaches the word of God, and they see his miracles, and yet they still remain unbelieving. Jesus wondered, and then he left. Never to return to his own hometown. He went throughout the villages teaching the word. Jesus is more than a, car a carpenter. He's God. Jesus is more than a prophet. He is Lord, And let me tell you as I close, every human being that has ever existed will one day, I don't care what they feel, they will have to bow the knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus' great, 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 great granddaddy called him Lord. In Genesis 22, Abraham at Mount Moriah says, the Lord will provide. A sacrifice for himself to the point that Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 56 Abraham rejoiced to see my day David Jesus great 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 grandfather called him Lord Psalm 110 verse 1 the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand to make thy enemies a footstool for thy feet James the brother of Jesus called him Lord, James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude, in verse 3, called Jesus Master and Lord. The angels in glory call him Lord, and they bow at his feet. The Bible says in order to be saved, you've got to confess him as Lord. We we'll call on the name of of the Lord shall be saved. Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 and 11 says that one day at the name of Jesus every knee, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord 
to the glory of God. What does that mean? One day the Pharisees will call him Lord. The Sadducees will one day call him Lord. The residents of Nazareth will one day bow down and call him Lord. Our president one day will bow down and call him Lord. The House of Representatives one day bow the knee and call him Lord. The U.S. Senate will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. The governor of Virginia will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. The mayor of Lexington will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. Louis Farrakhan will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. Hindus will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. Buddhists will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. Jehovah Witnesses will one day bow the knee and call him Lord. Muhammad will bow the knee and call him Lord. Every knee shall bow. Atheists will bow and call him Lord. Agnostics will bow down and call him Lord. Scientists will one day bow down and call him Lord. Charles Darwin one day will bow down and call him Lord. Jesus is more than a a carpenter, church. He is God in human flesh, and he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Amen? Amen. 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 And if we call him Lord, we must bow to him as Lord. Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? It's a responsibility in all of our parts as we stand to be humble and willing to bow our hearts to Jesus as Lord. Maybe someone here tonight come to the realization that you need to bow your heart to Christ as Lord. You realize you're a sinner. And you've been living your own way in rebellion against his will. Bible commands you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and receive him as Lord. There are those of us who are saved and we need to bow to the Lord's will even when it comes to church membership. Come. 23 in your hymn.
as we leave this place, we really have a lot of things that we're going to think about doing this week, but only one thing is really necessary, and that's to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. As we gather for our closing benediction, a reminder, this coming Wednesday will be our noon and evening Bible study in light of the UK basketball game. Our men's ministry breakfast will be this coming Saturday at at 9 a.m. in the main sanctuary, so please be aware of that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we bless and thank you for sending your son, Jesus, our perfect prophet, priest, and king. We will one day see him, and we will bow the knee in worship and proclaim with joy, Jesus is Lord. We thank you for saving us, Lord. We could be just like the people of Nazareth. So much exposed to your word, the full revelation of your truth contained in scripture. And find excuses and reasons not to believe it. Oh God, I thank you for yanking us out by your grace and mercy giving us a heart, taking away the heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh to receive Christ. Help us to walk with him this week. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all we can ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus from generation to generation. Let the church say. Love you, Main Street.